So we can move on. Uh, next speaker we have is Mr. Marko Dimitrievich, staff software engineer at Vroom, uh, who will show us what good practices when making models is, uh, because sometimes get, uh, creating a good model is not good enough. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. Dimitrievich. Hi all, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Marko Dimitrievich. Uh, I'm from Belgrade, from around here. Uh, I'm working at Room as a staff software engineer. So, what's Room? Room is basically an uh, e-commerce company. We are a car retailer. We buy and sell cars online, to put it simply. And so, for doing that. Uh, what that includes is basically you would go to a web form, you want to sell your car to Vroom, you would put in details about your car there and some ha magic happens on our end and basically you get back a price what we would offer you for your car. And in that magic, it makes sense we do a lot of data science, how we come up with a price that we want to offer a customer. Also, we have a lot of that on the other end when we are selling cars to customers, we need to find a good way to price the car. There's a lot of more, lot more data science that happens, but let's see how one example of a data science model works here. Um, have in mind, this is an engineer's perspective, so data science part is gonna be a little bit less complex and engineering part is gonna be a little bit more complex. So basically, what we have, we have some of the inputs that are defined. Uh, in our case, if you wanna price a car, we would have a description of that vehicle, let's say a location, a lot of data about the market, what's happening on the market, what's the supply, what's the demand, and we do some processing. So the main things about the processing is you would have lots of historical data, you would, that, you would use that to train the model, and then when we have the actual model, we would do that to do the processing in real time, so to say, and then define, a, a, let's say, price prediction for that vehicle. So in our use case, most of our models have one big requirement and that's that they need to run in real time. What that means is you're not able to have lots of data and then get some new data in there and then run your model again after it's trained and then produce the price predictions. We really need to do that in real time as a customer comes along, he gives us some information, we need to have a feedback for them right away. So imagine if you have come to a website, you have a form to fill out and then someone says, okay, you'll get an email back like in a day or two or something like that. People are not gonna like that. So basically we are giving back predictions in real time. Our models run sometimes in a couple of milliseconds or sub-second usually. So that's one of the big requirements that's gonna define the way we do things. So. Uh, what does it mean to run it in production? So, okay, you now have a data science model, you have a proof of concept, you have something that takes in data, gives out results, and you're happy with the results. That's where the engineering part comes in. So, we need something that has a really well-defined inputs and outputs. Basically, you don't want to say, okay, I take data from this database, from this table, we need to define each and every one of the inputs and have it be understood company-wide. So we are able to provide the inputs and the right inputs and we don't miss naming of the fields. We don't miss, let's say we have a location, for example. If you say my model takes a vehicle and a location for that vehicle, you could ask, okay, but what is that location? Is it the location of where the vehicle is located in? Is, is it the location of where we're gonna ship the vehicle to recondition it? Or is it the location of the buyer of the vehicle? Do we know where we're gonna sell it? So a location field could have a bunch of different meanings depending on the con context and who from the company is looking at that location. They're gonna assume different things. So that's why it's really important to define those things. We also want to return a result every time. Even if it's an error, we want to know what the behavior is gonna be. That's really important for running in production. You don't want to break a front end or a website just because a model returned a bad result. So we need to understand all of those. We need to understand all of the edge cases. We need to be ready for everything that can happen in production. 
And also one other important thing for us is performance. So we need to be able to run fast, we need to be able to scale, to be able to cover all the inputs or all the, let's say, number of requests per second that we get going from one request per second where we want to run really cheap and be able to have multiple models that run cheap to having thousands of requests per second where you want to be able to scale fast, cover all of that, but still maintain the quality of your service. So uh, two main topics that we will cover here is how we build the model pipeline. That's the part where we actually prepare the inputs, we put them through the model, and then how we handle the outputs of the model, get them into the right place where they need to be. And then the other part is actually hosting the model. There we're gonna cover how we actually get the model that we take from the data science, how we make that into something that can run into production, that can be called, that can be scaled, that can do all of the cool stuff that we need to do with it. And let's, before we go to that, let's also cover what does an engineering team do here. So this is a data science conference, we're talking about a data science model, that's all the data science work. So we basically help people create the hosting of the model, create the plumbing for that, getting the inputs to the right place, outputs to the right place. We take care of all the monitoring and scaling. We're the ones that get woken up in the middle of night where something is not working. And so we want to have good monitoring. We, were, we want to be able to scale for that. Also, we do a lot of consulting. So we help data scientists rework the model to actually fit the production use case. Sometimes you have a great model, but it doesn't really use the data that's, that we have available in a place where we have to call it. So we help do that. We also have help a lot on the optimiz optimization part of the code, so making stuff run fast. It's always great to use data frames to pass huge amounts of data through models. Sometimes we need to cut, cut off that to get some performance that we need to. So that's all the things that we do. And also from experience, from knowing how stuff breaks, we know to ask the right questions beforehand so we don't get into a situation that we hit a wall and we don't know what to do next. So for building the model pipeline, uh, what we do is Assuming the research part is done, the algorithm is picked, we already have an MVP, we already have a model, we go back to the drawing board, actually. We identify what are the inputs, we check if we really have those inputs and how we can work with them. Maybe you're training on inputs that are higher up the level, somewhere deep in the company, and you would need to run somewhere closer to the front end, so Maybe some aggregation is already done, maybe something needs to be changed. So we make sure that the inputs are actually the right inputs. Then we try and automate the training part. That's gonna be much important later, but understand that we are working in a market that's really moving fast. So having the training part automated, that you can deliver models weekly, daily, even hourly, you're constantly keeping up with the market, you're de delivering new models, and our platform actually allows for that, that the whole process is automated and you just get the new model running in production. And so once we get those parts, now we actually produce the model, so now we have the actual model that we can work with. We need to figure out where in the system we want to integrate it. We'll cover some of that later again, but basically we need to find a place that's closest to the source of data, but also has all of the data that the model needs. Sometimes we need to move up through the stack until you get to the right aggregation that the model needs for some of the data. And also, we make sure that the outputs are delivered to the right place. You would be amazed how often it happens that we have a great model that's working great, that's producing the outputs, but you're not able to get that to the right team, to get that to the right part of the process, just because you're missing some of the integrations, you're missing some of the timings, you're running too slow, they don't want to wait for that. Too slow either in actually implementing this and getting it ready for some of the features that you're pulling, or too slow in terms of the runtime that some operations really need to happen quickly. So here an example of a system. This is not really a good system, so let's see what's wrong with it. So let's say we are building some model, and let's say it's one of the signals it's gonna use is, is gonna be actions that are produced by the customer. So on the side of the front end, 
we have an action that's being produced. We go further, we have a backend. There we have a list of actions. Let's say we have a list of actions for a session. So you're on there for 15, 20 minutes, something like that. The backend is going to keep the list of actions you produce there. You, you move up the stack through the service. Now you're doing some reporting, some aggregation. You're going to have maybe actions per day for a customer that, that happened during the previous day. You aggregate that, you write that into a database. You have some even more data aggregation, even more data processing. Now you have average actions per all of your users. So you create something that's user activity that can, let's say, be either high, medium, low, something like that for each user. So now you have that. That's a great input into the model. So you have an active user, you have an inactive user, you have something in between. So let's say the model plugs in there. So we have the data collection, it pulls from there, it does the training, creates the model, that model is taking activity for a user, let's say even as a string. And you want to integrate that, and you try to integrate that on the back end to get the prediction. And that's one of the issues that we have, that now you have on the back end user activity that's defined as something completely different as a list of actions in the current session and the model ex is expect expecting to get something that's user activity as a string that's comparing that day's user activity with other users and their averages. So this demonstrates how important it is to communicate early and to be sure that you know what your model is going to take in and how it's going to work. Uh, here, one solution we could propose is have a JSON lookup table, have something like that that's going to be able to convert the current activity and compare that to something that you have compiled or inferring, and maybe you know all the averages, and you compare one session, and you're able to extrapolate from that and figure out what would be the user activity. But so. The common issues that we are seeing, one of them was demonstrated here, but there's a lot of them. But basically, when model is using data that's too far upstream, so we need to be able to work together with the data science, together with future teams, with engineering, and get the model to use as raw data as possible. Maybe do some of the normalization, some of the processing at actual runtime when you get the data into the model, and also have in mind, we are here we are speaking about models that are running in real time, so streaming would be something that people also use for that, so you're getting only one piece of the data at the time. Uh, fields really get renamed a lot. Uh, I mentioned location at the start, so for something like that, having location as an input is really a bad thing. You would want to define what kind of location is that, so that's why we really want to use descriptive names for all of the inputs for the model or even have documentation that lists what's what is the real thing that you want in, in there. And then incomplete data. When you're training the model, it's really easy to just filter out everything that you don't need. Filter out everything that's not clean, that's not good enough for your standards. But when you're running live in production, you're going to get those things. You're going to get that bad data. Sometimes we have a model that's performing great. You run it. You see that the coverage is so bad. You can't really do anything. So now we start adding input. We start adding dirty data into it. And the performance goes down. So plan for that up ahead. Be ready for that so that we have models that have as wide coverage as we can get them when we actually go to production with them. That's one of the first questions that we ask how filtered the data is, is it going to be able to run in real production. So also the timing issues, as I mentioned, how long does it take to process the data? Many models are really built to run in batch. Building models to run in batch is great where you're training stuff, when you're making sure that your model is performing well, you're running on huge data sets, you get the results back, you're happy or not happy, you do the iteration, you're able to move quickly. but if you're running in real time, you need to be able to run on a single piece of data. You want to optimize for that, not just for the batch use case. Um, real issues that we are facing also as a timing issue is how long does it take to do the whole integration? So you have the model, you're ready, you present it to someone higher up in the company. They say, great, put it into production. 
if that is the point when you start speaking with the engineering team, when you start speaking with other teams, you're already late to the game. Basically, we want to start communicating, to start uh, exchanging ideas as early as possible in the process. So when the training process is starting, when the model is being built, we want to discuss about inputs, about outputs, so that we are ready to build a pipeline. You already understand the limitations of what's really possible in reality. So it's really important to start that part of the process early. One more thing is when do we actually trigger the model? Sometimes people don't really think about that. So you would say, well, you have all the data, let's just run the model at right after front end on the back end side. We saw the, the previous slide when we were talking about user activity. You don't really have the user activity for that date, for that user. You have something that's much less than that. So we really need to be ready to to, to identify the, the time, the right time in the whole pipeline where the model can be run when we have all the data, but have it run early enough so that the outputs of the model can be used for something real. Uh, so some of the tips, really, this is called an engineering guide, the whole slide deck, but we can't, in this time, we can't do a real guide, we can't go into too much detail. So really, it's engineering tips for the type, things we should avoid and things we shouldn't do. But we build for data that's available at the model time and call place. We discussed that. We described inputs and outputs. We need to be able to communicate those clearly. We don't want to get into issues where the input and output names do not match and we have stuff that's passed in that's not really the right stuff. Um, I already gave this advice. This is one of the things that really helps us solve a lot of stuff. So uh, sending some of the data with the model, some of the input data with the model. So you have a mo trained model that's, a, let's say, some kind of py Python package, whatever it is. And you can pass in, in our system at least, a lot of JSON lookup tables or whatever else you want to use for storing data that go with the model. And let's say you want to describe a popularity of a car and you cannot get that as an input. So you can build from your data, from your training, you could build something that translates year, make, model of the car to some popularity score. You could train that with the model. You could package that in those files and deliver that with the model. That way, someone else doesn't have to provide that as an input. You are able to deduce that from your training data. You have it at runtime with the model, and the code that's going to execute the model can just run the query on that. That's really fast. It's basically a lookup table. Get back the results, and your model can have that as an input. That's a really good shortcut to do. Also, that describes how important is it to retrain the models often and really often so that you update that data with the model as well as the model. And also one of the things that I always mentioned, be careful with input data that's a string. That's really hard to normalize sometimes. Sometimes you have fields that are user inputs. We try to normalize that. We have a huge process of normalization at room. Uh, sometimes stuff gets through, so the model should be ready for all kinds of stuff something appears once a year and breaks the model and creates a bad prediction. You don't really want to have too many bad predictions when you're pr predicting prices that you're offering to people. So that was the first topic about the pipelines. So we know how to provide inputs, where to get the data, where the data is going to go. Now we want to talk more about how we host the models. This is more the engineering part now more important for getting the performance out of that. So what does our platform offer that we as an engineering team are offering to our data science team is basically a template of how to build and deliver models. Uh, for that, we are able to iterate easily with them. We are able to provide all of the scaling or all of the monitoring. We are able to add new features easily, and we are really able to move fast with all of this. So let's see an example of this. So we'll look at the bottom here. So the top still represents the, 
the pipeline that we had before. Now we built a service. This is going to represent our pipeline. It's going to get all of the inputs that we need to, and then it's going to call into the model hosting service. So what we offer here is a training process that can be completely disconnected from the rest of the service. We deliver the train model and model data into a remote repository. This doesn't have to be a code repository. It could be something in S3, like really a storage that we can download stuff off. We split the model into two things. We split into model code and then the model data. Basically, the model data is the result of the training process, and the model code is something that knows how to use the model data. Here we can see we have the model artifact. You could have more than one model uh, that's uh, basically contained into one model representation. So you could have a model that has three submodels in it that are running in sequence or in parallel and have their outputs uh, go out as a single thing. And then we have the lookup data, the lookup tables, the stuff that we talked about previously. So what this allows us is for each time the training process runs and produces a new model data version, our service is able to dynamically load that from the remote repository to dynamically start the model hosting process and to expose the model for all the colors that are calling it. Here, the REST API is being used. So basically, you have a route. Here, we have a parameter that can be defined that basically picks the model that you want to use. We have also something that we are calling as, sorry, that we are calling aliases. That's something that's able to point to a specific version of a model. So for all of your callers, you would say, you always use the latest version of my model. The latest version is going to be something I pick. So you have version 1, version 2. You're happy with version 2. You promote that to latest. Everyone is going to use latest. You continue experimenting. You have version 3, version 4. You're still not happy. Maybe you get to version 5. Now you're happy. Now you've flipped your latest alias to that. No one has to update anything or all of the services. It's basically just a step of data scientists giving approval for us and us flipping the alias to the right thing. It's all being hosted in parallel. You can do A-B testing really easily. You could have one request that's using model version A or one, or one request that's using model version two, and you compare those two, you run them in real time, you get the results back. So uh, the split that I talked about, between model data and model code. You can think uh, of model code as basically some of the, let's say, Python code that you have around your model to just call it, to call the predict function on it, to, let's say, transform JSON data input into a data frame, pass that into the model, uh, and get the outputs out, maybe transform that from uh, a data frame to something like a JSON, and that's it. That's something that should be really simple. It can. Uh, also contain some of the transformation logic, but all of that transformation logic should be driven by model data. How we do that? Again, some of the configuration files, some of the JSON lookup files that you can read from the Python code. So basically, let's say we are doing some filtering. You want to filter out or default some values based on if they are in the range or not in the range. You would define the code in model code, but you would define the range in model data. You load that up, so when you have the next model iteration, you can change the range without updating the model code. The point is that we don't want to change the model code very often. We want to change the model data very often. That's updated with each retrain. The model data is living in the service. It's owned by the engineering team. It's the thing that we use to run the model data. Model data is living somewhere in a remote storage is basically a set of files that's going to be owned by the data science team. They can just update new versions there as long as they work with API that's defined in the model code. That's how we get separation from hosting to data science work. That's how we're able to easily iterate and add new versions and get support for them immediately, dynamically, at runtime. So here's all of that, but just easier and written out. So basically, we want to write, write that simple code. When a data scientist comes to an engineering team, they would have the model data. They would have the outputs of their training process. We would work together to write the code that's going to invoke that. Usually, if you were testing with your model, you already have that code. So it's easy to work with that. 
uh, you would define all the dependencies. Do you use TensorFlow? Do you use GPUs? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe you only use CPUs, something like NumPy, whatever. Uh, we want to deliver the model data into a remote location. We want to iterate to work, to work, to work, to make sure the model is working as you expect to test it again. We would get the same results, presumably, as we got in initial testing. Then we are ready to integrate with other services. So what we get is integration, fast and easy model updates, easy and fast testing. You have all your previous models that are hosted uh, uh, at uh, current time. You're able to get them. How that actually works is with the hardware limitations. We don't want to pay uh, a fortune for this. We are running few of the models that are actually hosted and running and live. When you ask, let's say, for a model data version from 10 years ago, something that was there a long time ago, we are still able to load that up. It's going to take a few seconds, maybe a minute. We load that up. Now it's fast, it's hot, it's ready to be run. Then you have those sub-second response times. After that, use some other model data versions. The old one get, gets replaced, and that's it. Basically, we have a list of models that we keep warm on some logic. When you ask for something that's not warm, warm we load it, we run it, it's there for you. Easy data manipulation. In that model code, you're able to do whatever manipulations you want, but drive them with model data, so we're easy to do that. Monitoring constant uptime. It's designed for scaling and cost optimizations. We really do run hundreds, thousands of requests per second for some of this. It's uh, an architecture that's really able to scale uh, and get whatever we need done. What else we do? Uh, we'll, well, we can do it here. So here's one of the examples. So basically, you would have a host. You would have a model that you select. You want to predict on that model. You want to define a model data version. You send a request uh, via REST API, let's say in JSON format. You have a request. You give a description of your vehicle. You get back a response. In this case, we are trying to predict, let's say, reconditioning. It's a Lamborghini. It's going to be a lot of money to recondition that. That makes sense. So this is one example of how easy it would be to call the model that's hosted in our service. If you want to call a different model data version, you change this to a different model data version. You get back a different result. What I didn't mention is that we are able to share the instances in EC2 that are running these models. We are able to run multiple models on a single instance they are sharing CPU, they are sharing memory. So if you have models that are not used a lot, they're all going to be co-located on instances. That's really doing uh, uh, great things for our uh, cost savings. We're able to run on GPU, on CPU. We're able to run any kind of a model. You just defi define the dependencies. We run them. We store the model data. The stuff that we mentioned is the output of the training in S3. That's where. Uh, we load it from, we dynamically discover data there, basically promoting a model or deploying a model is uploading the files to S3. Everything after that happens automatically. We can run in batch. Uh, we usually run in real time. Even our batch processes basically stream data in real time and produce the results. And we have a lot of specialized services that are able to cache stuff and to call these models. Uh, don't build a model in a silo. I think that's one of the main points. Uh, you want to communicate. You want to understand where the inputs are coming from, where the outputs are going. You want to know that the engineering team is going to be able to get the inputs that you need. So start talking about that early. That's how we will be able to get what you need for that. Uh, automated support for updating models. What that means is basically once you create a model, once we automate the training, the data science has a hands-off approach. They don't have to do anything. Each time, each day, each week, whatever we define, the model is going to be retrained. If you want to iterate on that, that's still easy. You update the training process. As long as we keep the API for the calling code, it's still going to work. We do also update the calling code as needed if we get something else. Uh, room is hiring. We have a lot of other stuff that we want to cover and that we want to update. We want to build a way to automatically test and display results for the models that uh, get deployed to our S3 and get automatically hosted. So not just that you have a model, you have a description of how that model is performing and then that's something we can use for deciding if you push it to production or not. 
I tried being fast, so I skipped a lot of stuff. But if anyone has any questions, I'm open for that. OK, we'll have time for one quick question, and then we'll have to move on. And you can always find Mr. Marco uh, around the conference somewhere. Uh, hi. So what happens like um, when you're con continuous monitoring pipeline alerts you that model is underperforming? So uh, our monitoring uh, mostly focuses on the health of the service. When you say model is underperforming, you would say something like the predictions are not as good as we would expect them. So basically, that's why we have those continuous model updates. So you would see what the issue is in the next iteration of the model. You would fix either the training. You would see what's happening with the inputs, with the outputs. We have continuous uh, test of the model before they get promoted to production, so you would see if you have prices that are continuously falling, prices that are continuously rising, so you would catch that even before it goes to production, and you have to be alerted. But if there is an anomaly, you would get alerted for that, you would fix the training process, update the model, and then in the next iteration, you would have solved the problem. Sometimes you can solve the problem, sometimes it's, <laughs> it's really hard. And uh, how often do you retrain the models? It really depends on the models. Hourly, daily, weekly, monthly. And it's an automated process, right? Yeah. Basically, once you have the training automated, it's just of picking the time of when do you want to run it. So it and the cost of running, on, you know, running it on machines. But that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.